you may be seated. Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. Nice to see everybody today. Just a few announcements this morning. Um, we do have a Christmas program coming up on October 23rd, and uh, the practices for the Christmas program will begin after Sabbath this morning. Um, the Christmas program is uh, December 18th. What did I say, October? October 23. Okay, that today. We can't that's that. not happening today. <laughs> Why does it say October 23rd? Oh, because that's for practice. I always she should have done the uh, Christmas program announcement. I see all the choir members for the practice. All right, thank you, Ms. Liga. Um, practice is October 23rd after Sabbath today. The program is December 18th, man. All right, here we go. Um, so the, another announcement this morning is the Pathfinder meeting. Um, after church today at 2.30, there will be a Pathfinder meeting. Also, there will be a cooking class uh, here at the church uh, tomorrow, October 24th. Um, there's also a Three Angels Youth Orchestra that they have assembled, and rehearsal for that is from 2 to 3 p.m. every first and third Sabbath. So if you have any children that uh, play an instrument that are interested in the youth orchestra, um, they're meeting every first and third Sabbath from 2 to 3 p.m. Um, also, there's an international day choir that they've assembled. Okay. Okay, that shouldn't be in the bulletin either. All right, um, so I'm going to give up on the announcements this morning, and we're going to have uh, Orlando Carmona come up for the Steps to Christ project. Thank you. Happy Sabbath. I am pleased to report, if you look in your bulletin, we have made just under, we are almost at the halfway mark. In just two weeks, we're at the halfway mark of the, the sum that we are trying to save up for the Steps to Christ project. We are going for 7,500. We are almost there, and that is to reach over 10,000, this is not incorrect, 10,000 different households here in Kernersville. Uh, a little bit more for me in a minute, but there is work being done. Miracles are already happening. Yes. So we have a promise, Psalms 5, verse 12. Surely he has blessed the righteous and surrounded them with his favor as a shield. So this week, in going out on errands, I'm like, okay, where do we need to, who needs this, uh, copies of this? And I was led to a, a shop up on Piney Grove, and so pulled into the parking lot, but the Lord reminded me, okay, now pray first and ask for my favor. So I said, please, Lord, give me your favor with the proprietor. Went in, looked around, shopped around, and then came up to the register, and I said to the lady, um, gee, you know, I got this in uh, Steps to Christ. just talks about Jesus and his love and and how to follow the Lord. I said, can I leave a few? She says, oh, yeah. She says, I had a dozen with me, a dozen. That's 12. And she says, oh, here, let's move this stuff off the counter and put them right up front where everybody can see them. That's the favor of the Lord. God is faithful. Amen. Amen. So things are already happening. Praise yeah. the Lord. So for those of you that can give financially towards this cause, if you just write on your tithe envelope, uh, Steps to Christ Project, it'll be sure to go to the right place. If you do not have financial means, but you have time, um, come to me and we will be able to give you some copies of the book Steps to Christ and you can give it out to your neighbors, to your coworkers, to whoever the Lord impresses you, as long as you pray for those divine appointments. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that some of you are thinking, well, I already gave, or, or you're thinking, what if, what if they uh, get too much money? Rest assured, we will use, so, so it's not, um, once we hit that threshold, that's it. What we'll do is we will increase our radius, and we will give to more households surrounding the, the current area, so more than 10,000. So don't be afraid to give. 
Thank you. God bless. We also have one more announcement uh, regarding the TCA meeting that we had last Sabbath about uh, the planning meeting that we had last Sabbath. Pastor Ferguson is going to speak on that. Yes, this uh, past Sabbath afternoon, uh, I slipped over to TCA after I preached here and my wife and I were there and we caught the afternoon uh, sessions. And I'll tell you, um, Don asked me at the end, he says, Pastor, would you like to say something? And I was still trying to get my thoughts together. And uh, here's what I, I wish I had said. I, th I, thank them, I thank them for what they had done and commended them, but looking at what we did, this is absolutely phenomenal that we have a lay-led, you know what I mean by that? Rather than the conference office telling us that we need to do something, we have actually something that spontaneously comes up from within our church ranks, and it was a session to not plan an event, but to plan a lifestyle. And everyone can get on board with it if you want. If you don't, please keep coming. You're part of the church family. What is the purpose of what we did? We laid plans down on how to reach the community, finish the work, and go home. Yeah. I mean, what was yesterday? Can someone tell me, what's the date for yesterday? October 22, and someone here might be saying, so what, October 22. Does anyone see any significance that yesterday was October 22? Huh? Raise your hand. Huh? I mean, that was like the birthday of Adventism, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we're still here 177 years later. Someone says, uh, well, Jesus paid it all at the cross. Yes, and then Jesus gave us the gospel commission to go tell the world. And that's what that planning session was about last week. How are we going to do it? And it's not just through an event. It's through a lifestyle of reaching out to our friends and neighbors. You'll be hearing more about it, but pray for us as we implement the things that we discussed last Sabbath afternoon. Good morning. Happy Sabbath to each and every one of you. Uh, I would like to say before I get to the prayer part that um, my Sabbath school class, we just finished the study over the last several months on the book of the Great Controversy and just finished that this morning. What a blessing it's been. Uh, this next Sabbath, my class is starting another study on another book, and it's called Christ Our Righteousness. How many remember being at the uh, seminar we did on that uh, a few years ago? Yeah, several of you. Uh, wonderful book, wasn't it? And, uh, you know, uh, it says on the front of this book, uh, from Sons and Daughters of God, it says, One interest will prevail, and one subject will swallow up every other, and that's called Christ Our Righteousness. And, uh, you know, that is the third angel's message in verity, is it not? Is Christ our righteousness? And um, I would like to think that everybody in God's church has experienced Christ our righteousness, but, perhaps, but maybe not. You know, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, you know, is going to see the kingdom of heaven. So um, next Sabbath, we're starting this book. It's called Christ Our Righteousness by Bill Lehman. Uh, several of you still have this book, I'm sure. I've got a couple of extra copies. Uh, you can order them um, off Amazon, I guess, or wherever you'd like to get them. But uh, if, you, if you don't have a class that you regularly go to or whatever, you're welcome to come to my class back in the, um, in the new section of the church back there in my classroom, and we will start studying about Christ our righteousness uh, next week. We really need Christ our righteousness in the times that we're living in. So anyway... That being said, we have a, um, a, the prayer request today um, is mostly dealing with something, I don't know if you've heard of it yet, it's called COVID. I see plenty of it every week in the hospital. Um, so most of the members here uh, know Bruce and Carol Freeman um, and Sherry and her sister Cherie and the family. 
and uh, they've been such a big part of this church. I know Bruce and Carol used to have the uh, bread shop. Hey, remember the bread shop we used to have as a social in the evenings? That was wonderful. So many new people here. I, how many here remember the bread shop? Raise your hand. Okay, a lot of, most people. That was a wonderful experience, and, and Bruce and Carol has always put a lot of work into this church, you know, when it comes to the social activities and all. Carol is now bedridden and uh, is having a lot of issues, and COVID being one of them. I think Cherie had it, and uh, I think now Cherie's son has the COVID, and Bruce has ended up with COVID, and he went to the hospital this morning. I hear that they have ventilated him. I am not sure. No? Okay. They have not. Well, I just hope that it not, does not come to that point. But uh, that whole family pretty much takes up most of this uh, prayer uh, list this morning. So, And I know, how many in here has been touched in your life by someone personally that has experienced even, or know of someone that has experienced death because of COVID? And a lot of hands are going up. And uh, we, uh, my daughter is one of her good friends in his early 30s, just died this week with it. And uh, I know so many that has died with this. It's real. And so anyway... We'd like to really lift up that family this morning uh, in prayer. Uh, Brianna Turner, the granddaughter of Priscilla, is, uh, is asking for prayer, for health, and other uh, reasons. Um, and then uh, Brenda Wild's co-worker, uh, Lee Bavone, uh, is also asking uh, for re prayer because she is also in the hospital. And um, there are so many other, you know, uh, I'm sure hearts out there that are that are needing prayer, that are that are, are suffering with burdens you know, in your heart, and uh, and so this morning as we come to the Lord in prayer, those that have special burdens upon your heart and would like to to come forward, we always have the garden of prayer up here that you're welcome to come and uh, to kneel. And so if you would like to join me, we'll meet you up front now. Jesus, we come to you this morning on bended knee. As we approach your throne, Father, we come with, um, as you ask us to, with boldness, with confidence, Lord, that you're there to meet us. Lord, you promised to save us to the uttermost, those that come to the Father through you, seeing that you ever live it to make intercession for us. And Lord, what a privilege we have to come to you in prayer. We can talk to you face to face as with a friend. Help us not to neglect that, Father. Each day in our lives, help us to come on our knees as, as the day approaches. We need it more and more. Father, all this week you've been with each of every one of us. You've been with us in the ditches and the trenches with your sleeves rolled up as you've gone through battle with us, Father. You've been there shoulder to shoulder, hand to hand, Father. And we are so grateful. And this morning, Father, we come to you as you're lifted up on your throne as a transcendent God. As we come to worship you in spirit and in truth, Father, and praise you for all that you've done for us throughout this week. And for all that you're going to do for us, Father, as individuals, as a church. Lord Jesus, we need revival and reformation. We need it individually. We need it corporately. Father, we're living in serious times as we've read your word. We know the end of the chapter, and we know, Father, that we're there. 
There's no hiding that. But, Father, we want to be ready. You're not willing that any should perish. And so, Father, this morning we just ask for your Holy Spirit and for your grace to sustain us throughout this process. Lord, we're the church militant. Help us to go forward to meet the battles of life and to meet the battles spiritually that come our way, Father, that we'll hold up the banner of Jesus Christ and we'll go forward from faith to faith as it is written the just will live by faith. Father, we ask for your blessing upon this church. Lord, as last week you know that we, many of us gather together, Lord, with your precious spirit and we, we just brainstormed all that we could to find ways, Lord, to get this church involved, to grow, to go forward, Lord, and to finish the work that you have for us in this area to complete. You save us and then you bid us to go forth. Lord, we're soldiers of the cross. We're not just here to play church. The hour's late. We want to be like the five virgins, Lord, that are trimming their lamps and that are ready to meet the foe, Lord, through your power, through your might. We know that dark and treacherous is the night that's before us, but we want to rise with healing, Father, for this earth. We want to show forth your character to those who are around us, that they'll see Christ in us. They'll look at this church and know that we love one another as you have loved us. Father, I lift up this prayer request to you this morning, Lord. You know each burden. You know each heart. Lord, you're the great physician. As you have said in your word, there is nothing too hard for you, and I believe that, Lord. In all of our lives, each of us in this church that are going through health issues or through spiritual issues, financial, help us to come to you on our knees, Lord, and acknowledge to you that there is nothing too hard for you, that you've got this if we trust in you. We need faith, Father. We need that power from above. We need to be able to trust you. If we can't trust you now, we're not going to be able to trust you when that time comes. Help us to learn now to put our faith and hope in you. Be with Bruce and be with Carol and with Sherry and Sheree and all of that family, fathers, that are going through this dreaded disease, that you'll lay a healing hand upon them in a very special way, Father. They've been here. They serve you. They've been your servants. They love you, Father. And I just pray that your will will be done in each of their hearts, each of their lives, Lord. Father, I pray for the others that are on here, Lord, for... Um, you know their health issues and what's going on in their lives. And you love them, Father. You gave your life for them. You know the very number of hairs on their head. And, Father, we put them into your hands and lift them up to your throne this morning. May your grace be sufficient for them and sustain them throughout whatever they're going through. Lord, I ask this morning for our speaker, for Brother Ferguson, Lord, that your spirit rest upon him, Lord, that he will break to us the bread of life as you've given to him to give to others. And help us to be ready to receive it with open hearts. The engrafted word, Lord, that's able to save our souls. Thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day. May it be a joy to us. May we proclaim it more fully, Father, as the day approaches. I ask all of these things in the loving name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us. Amen. <laughs> Good morning, church. <clears throat> I should not say church. I should say good morning, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> it's so good to see everybody here. I know we've been uh, away for the last, uh, for the past two Sabbaths. We've been active in another church that needed our help. And this morning, I'm here with um, a small group of my students <clears throat> from the school, and they are uh, usually come to this church. So these are your children, <clears throat> as well as mine. And we are happy to sing together and praise God for the uh, song service. So please join us. We will start with Count Your Blessings. Excuse me. Excuse me. Brian, can you turn on the mics here? Some of them are not working. Thank you.
I invite you to stand for our opening song, Search Me, O God. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. If you will turn with me to Matthew 25 and verse... 35, scripture we all know probably by heart. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. You know, I was really encouraged last week as well to see some of the ideas and the heart this church has for its community and to help it. And one of the ones that stood out to me was um, the idea to build a sanitarium here in Kernersville. Amen? Amen? So I know our church has a passion for the community and those around us. Today's offering is for the Carolina youth. And as I read through the notes that the conference shares, for this, It was a really touching story about how children were helping one another and sharing their gloves in the wintertime so they all could play in the snow. And I was reminded of the hearts that children have for those around them and the compassion, um, something that we might even sometimes call naive. And I was reminded of a story about five years ago. We were traveling. We were in Cincinnati, and we were out at the riverfront. And we were walking around. We were actually heading to dinner. And before we walked into this restaurant that was on the river, kind of beside the baseball stadium there, if you've ever been to Cincinnati, uh, there was a man sitting on the sidewalk, a homeless man asking for money. And my wife and I really didn't take much notice. You know, if you're in a city, you see quite a bit of homelessness and people in need. Um, but our oldest son, Braden, who is here with us today. Hey, Braden. It really touched him, and uh, as we sat through dinner, he could not stop talking 
about the homeless man and how much that he felt like we needed to give him money. And I think sometimes we get jaded to some of those things and we think, oh, they're just going to use the money for things they shouldn't. But all he could see was someone in need. And youthfulness has almost naivety and blindness to being jaded by those things. And they just want to give and they just want to help and they just see the need. So these verses go on to say in Matthew 25, 40, and the king shall answer and say unto them, verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done also unto me. And we're reminded that that was exactly how Christ treated those around him. And so my plea with you this morning is that one, we pour into our youth here in the church. Um, They're our greatest asset. They're our future. That we give liberally to ministries like Carolina Youth who are doing that. And that we say a prayer that we have that heart of a child, that we have that youthful mindedness, mindedness, that we might see the needs of others so plainly and so clearly. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this Sabbath day, for this opportunity to gather and worship. And we thank you for the many blessings that you give us. Lord, please change our hearts so that we would have compassion on others and help us to pour into our youth that they might be uh, your disciples as we finish this work so we can come home. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hello? There we go. Good morning. It's time for our children's story now. So kids, if you want to go to the back and get your baskets and bring them up, collect the offering, and come on up front. I've got something to share with you today. look great this morning. There's a lot of you this morning. That's awesome. How many of you here like to eat cookies? Does anybody here like cookies? Yes. Cookies are one of my favorite desserts. So why, tell me some reasons why you like cookies. Because you like them. What else? They're delicious. They're not healthy. They have chocolate chips in them. Sugar, yes. Different flavors. It's chocolate, yeah. Okay, so do you, um, do any of those, oh, let me try that again. Do any of you know what things go into a cookie? Can you name some of the ingredients? Just call it out. Chocolate chips, flour. All right, so I've got some flour here. Somebody said sugar. Sugar. Oh, eggs. Yeah, eggs. I've got some eggs here. Chocolate chips. I didn't bring any chocolate chips with me. Anybody else have anything? Butter. Butter. Nuts. Sometimes I don't bring any nuts. Does anybody know what this is? It's white. Baking, this one's baking soda, but baking powder sometimes goes into it. Um, and then I've got something in here, salt. Yes. Okay. So if cookies are good, that means all these ingredients must be good, right? So would you ever consider eating these by themselves? 
Like, if I just gave you a spoonful of flour, would everybody be okay with that? You'd be okay with it? It'd be kind of dry if you didn't have anything to go with it. How about, and how about the baking soda? Has anybody ever tried baking soda by itself before? It doesn't taste that good, does it? How about raw egg? Does anybody want a raw egg to eat this morning? No? How about the salt? Well, the salt might not be too bad, but what if I made you eat the whole thing of salt? Would that be good? No, that would be yucky. How, and, the, well, the sugar. So the sugar might be okay to eat the whole, whole thing. <laughs> so it would make you hyper. You're right. <laughs> so life, life can be a lot like cookies, though. Separately, we have some bitter times and some raw, hurtful times and some dry, bland times. Like if you fall down and you get hurt, or if you don't do good on a test at school, or if one of your friends might say something mean to you. But then there are also some good times, like birthday parties, and um, a new baby brother or a baby sister, or a vacation, or a really yummy meal that you just had. But some of the cookie ingredients by themselves don't taste very good. But when everything's mixed together, we have delicious cookies to eat, right? Well, God is able to blend the good and the bad experiences in our lives for our good. And all together, they create a life that's meaningful, useful, and tasty. So in the Bible, in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 28, there's a beautiful promise. And it says, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his good purpose. The Bible is also full of some great examples of this, like Joseph. You know, if Joseph hadn't been sold into slavery, he may not have later been in the position to save his family from a famine. And Esther, how about Esther? If she wasn't where she was, she wouldn't have been able to save the Hebrew people from being killed. So all things in our life that happen are not good. But in God's hands, they can be mixed and blended along with the good into beautiful creation. And it's during the bad times we see how big our God really is. And he loves each of us, and he's in control, and we can trust him. So before you go back to your seats, I have uh, a cookie for you to take home with you. But first, we're going to say a prayer. And Thank God for giving us this beautiful promise. So bow your heads. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for the promises you give us in the Bible. Thank you for turning the bad things that happen into something that glorifies you. And please help us to remember this promise when things get hard. We ask all this in your name. Amen. All right, you can come get a cookie and then you can go back to your seats. Let me make sure that, yes, we're on. Judith, please come join me. I need not introduce Judith. You all know her face, at least, don't you? Yeah, yeah say hi to Judith. <laughs> you've, you've heard her earlier today during the worship service. Judith, we are so happy to have you as a part of our church family. Yeah. And today we have something we want to special, we want to share with the church, don't we? Yes, amen. What is that? Profession of 
joining of testimony of my profession to join the church. Did you get that? Yes, praise God. <laughs> my, that's a lot, yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> oh my, and, and so I have here in my hands a uh, certificate, you see right there, a profession of faith certificate with your name nicely done, isn't that nice? I tell you, Kernersville does it up first class, don't they? Yes. And, uh, of course, the 28 fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church are here. I think I've got some sound here. Can you hold that? There we go. And that's for you. And um, now that's for me. I've got this now. you got that. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So there are some things we have gone over, and I've enjoyed visiting with you in oh, our Bible wonderful. studies. Let's not stop. Amen. Yeah, we can keep meeting, you know. Yes. <clears throat> uh, there are 14, 13 things that these are actually the commitment of profession of faith. Amen. Uh, when a person, now you've already been baptized by immersion. Yes. So, right. yes. And so that is why this, we're doing it this way. Yes. If you had not been baptized, then this would be a baptismal certificate. So yes. it's clarification. All right. So I'm going to ask you these 13 things. and. Okay. We've gone over this before, so if you have any questions, then we'll talk about it. Right. Here it is. Number one, do you believe there is one God, mm. the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons? Yes, amen. Okay. And do you accept the death of Jesus Christ on Calvary as the atoning sacrifice for your sins and believe that through faith in his shed blood, you are saved from sin and its penalty? Yes, Number three, do you renounce the world and its sinful ways? And have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, believing that God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven your sins and given you a new heart? Yes. Do you accept by faith the righteousness of Christ, your intercessor in the heavenly sanctuary, and accept his promise of transforming grace and power mm -hmm. to live a loving Christian, uh, Christ-centered life in your home and before the world? Yes. Uh, number five, do you believe that the Bible is God's inspired Amen. word, the only rule of faith and practice for the Christian? And have you uh, covenanted to spend time regularly in Bible study yes. and prayer? Yes. Amen. Number six, do you accept the Ten Commandments as a transcript of the character of God and a revelation of his will? And is it your purpose by the uh, indwelling Christ to keep this law? his law, including the fourth commandment, which requires the observance of the seventh day of the week as a Sabbath of the Lord and the memorial of creation. Yes. That's a big one, isn't it? It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Number seven, do you look forward to the soon coming of Jesus and the mm. blessed hope when this mortal shall put on immortality? Yes. And, and um, immortality. And as you prepare to meet the Lord, uh, will you witness to his loving salvation? And, uh, and uh, by life and word, help others to get ready for the second coming of Jesus. Yes, yes. Number eight, do you accept the biblical teaching of spiritual gifts and believe mm. that the gift of prophecy is one of the identifying marks of the remnant church? Yes. So much so that you want to send it to every home in this community, <laughs> right? I do, yes. Yeah. And let me tell you what, when you what? get through with Steps to Christ, send the great controversy. The, amen, well. amen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Number nine, do you believe in church organization and is it your purpose to support the church by tithes and offerings, mm -hmm. your personal effort and influence? Yes, amen. Number 10, almost there. Almost there. Do you believe that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and will you honor God by caring for it, yes. avoiding that which is harmful like uh, unclean foods the Bible talks about and also smoking and alcoholic beverages and the misuse of drugs, that sort of thing? Yes. All right. Number 11, do you know and understand the fundamental beliefs, uh, principles, as taught by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and purpose by the grace of God to fulfill his will by ordering your life in harmony with these principles? Yes. Okay, number 12, do you accept the New Testament teaching of baptism by immersion, mm -hmm. and, ha and, and uh, you have been so baptized mm -hmm. as a public expression of your faith? Yes. yes. And the last one, do you accept and believe that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the remnant church of Bible prophecy and that people of every nation, race, kindred, tongue, and people are invited and accepted into its fellowship? Mm. And do you desire to be a member of this congregation 
and part of the Worldwide Seventh-day Adventist Church family. Yes. All right. <laughs> Is there someone who would like to move that we accept? Yeah, look at these. Things. All right, all in favor, raise your hands. <laughs> Standing up. Okay. I'm going to give you a hug again. Oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> The Lord, uh, the Lord has brought you to us. Amen. You have something that we need here. Oh, really? We had something I think that you've been blessed with as well. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So we're going to see more of Judah. Yes, yes. Thank you. So hug her today before you leave. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Happy Sabbath. Our scripture reading today will be found in Daniel chapter 8, verses 13 through 11. I mean 13 through 14. And it says, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the certain one who was speaking, How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? And then he said to me, For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Amen. Thank you. Judith, I did not give this to you. <laughs> there we go. I know that you're sitting there and we wouldn't hear a word I'm saying, saying he kept that. He didn't give it to me. <laughs> All right. Well, some may wonder where Sharon is today because she's always with me virtually and she is down at the Thomasville Seventh-day Adventist Church, has been all week attending meetings every day from morning, uh, afternoon, night, listening to an Australian Seventh-day Adventist uh, health educator, a naturopathic doctor. Her name is, can someone help me? Barbara O'Neill. Yes, Barbara O'Neill. Um, I told you our story, how we got acquainted with Barbara. And I'm going through this to tell you, she's down there, and I'm going down to, to uh, be with her this afternoon, and then we'll go home tonight. I'll be coming back this Tuesday and Wednesday. If someone um, would like to see me or, or need me, I'll be back. Or you can call me anytime. The number, I think, is in the bulletin. But uh, you can go down this afternoon, by the way. Barbara will be uh, at the have lunch. You'd get there and... She will be speaking all afternoon. Um, and it's not at the Seventh-day Adventist Church because the Seventh-day Adventist Church is meeting at the Unity Methodist Church in Thomasville. So you just Google it, whatever, look at maps, and put Unity Seventh-day Adventist Church, and it will take you down there. I would tell you how, but my maps tells me a different way every time I go. It, uh, I have found uh, 144,000, I think, ways to get to Kernersville <laughs> this week. <laughs> took me off of, of 85, I think it was, one, one uh, just yesterday, and then put me back on it about 10 miles later. I don't know what's going on. All right. Today um, is in view of yesterday being October 22. I thought there would be an opportunity to review some of the things, something new as well. Maybe I can share with you about the cleansing of the sanctuary. Does anyone have laundry day in your house? Yeah, you have laundry day? Well, I'm going to get to that. That's the title of my sermon, Laundry Day in Heaven. Yeah, can you believe that? There would be a laundry day in heaven. Thought you were going to get away from that, right? Okay. We'll get to that in a moment. Yesterday, as I said, is, uh, it was October 22, and I was uh, trying to figure out what to speak on, and I noticed it was going to be the day after October 22, and I knew that would all be on all of our minds. Why aren't we still here, right? Shouldn't we be in heaven by now? After October 22, after the end of the 2300-year prophecy, the Lord can come at any time. Uh, there is nothing that's restricting him from coming. Up to that time, uh, they perhaps did not know it, but Jesus had to get to the cleansing of the sanctuary, this work, this final work that's happening in the, in the heavenly sanctuary, even as we are here worshiping God. We'll look more at that. William Miller was the father of the second great 
awakening in North America. But it, this was more than just a North American great awakening. All around the world, there was spontaneous uh, speakers who were chosen by God, who were preaching a similar message all around the world at the same time. Uh, Mervyn Maxwell says that all denominations benefited from the revival brought on by William Miller. William Miller was a farmer. He did not want to be a preacher. That's another story I can tell you sometime, how he found his call to preach is when he was uh, older, you know, 50 years of age, called to preach. And uh, we need to take our hat off to his wife as well because she had to man the farm while he was out preaching. Became an ordained Baptist minister and preached something that was not preached in that day. And that is that Jesus is coming soon. You see, the, the, the vast um, majority of the people believed that the earth was going to get better and better and better. And uh, now, you know, they had things like trains that uh, showing you that man is getting better. And uh, modes of transportation were improving. And medicine seemed to be improving. And they had these visions that we were just going to get better and better. And they, the churches had lost view that Jesus is going to come back soon. And Jesus is going to take us all to heaven together, all those who accept him. And so from 1830 to 1844, that's what William Miller was preaching. No, Jesus is coming back. And when he comes, he's going to cleanse the earth with fire. And uh, to those who are not ready for him. And he did not do a lot of date setting, as people think. William Miller just preached, Jesus is coming back. And he showed from Bible prophecy, especially the books of Daniel and from Matthew and the Gospels about the second coming of Jesus. And people were showing up by the hundreds and the thousands. He preached in some of the largest churches in America. He would preach anywhere they would ask him to preach. The first uh, time he was asked to preach, he refused to preach in the church. He was a humble man and a uh, very smart fellow, brilliant, talented, but he was humble. When he found Jesus to be his best friend, he became humble. And he, he felt unworthy to preach in the church. And so they preached, he preached sitting down in an armchair in the living room of the house next door to the church. And they said, this is profound. Will you come back tonight? And uh, the house was, was full, and so they had to move to the church, and he preached that night, and he preached the next night, and the next night for a whole week, and he never went back to farming again. His wife had to keep the farm going. This was William Miller. More could be said about him. Read any of the books by our historians about William Miller. They'd be worth your while. I chose this passage today that Abigail read so well, and... Uh, uh, from Daniel 8, 14, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. This was a key passage for William Miller. William Miller looked at this and he compared the Bible and he said, Jesus could come in our day. And this is another thing he preached. Not only is Jesus coming, it, it, it could be even in our time that Jesus could come. In our lifetime, Jesus could come. And that's what he preached. Jesus is coming soon. And people showed up and they gave their hearts to the Lord. They confessed their faults to each other. They, they, they made wrongs right. It was a time that was precious for them as the Holy Spirit moved on the hearts of men and women and children. One of those young ladies was Ellen White, Ellen Harmon at the time, baptized at a young age. I believe it was nine years of age. And uh, she had some things I'm going to share with you, uh, a couple of slides here, statements how she said it was the sweetest time of our life. It wasn't a lot of date setting again. It was getting right with Jesus and looking forward to going home to see Jesus and to going to heaven. 2 Peter 3 verse 7 says, The heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. And so William Miller would say the good news is that we can all go home. The bad news is if we do not get right with God, we will suffer eternal flames. Now, this is what he believed the earth was going to be destroyed with fire, and the Bible says that. He was right in that the earth will be destroyed with fire, but that will come after Jesus returns to this earth in the future. And, and he said, so you've got a choice, my friends. You can either get right with God, and we'll all go home together, 
or you'll be left behind and you'll be caught in the crossfire as God destroys and cleanses this earth. So you felt the earth would be cleansed. <laughs> the good news is, even today, isn't it, that Jesus is coming soon. And there is no reason for anyone within my hearing to be left behind. There's no reason. And when he comes, it's not like many people say and believe, and that is he comes silently. It's called the secret rapture theory. It's a theory. It's not biblical. Nowhere in the Bible does he say, does it say he's coming secretly. This was a figment of someone's imagination. And they came up with it, and a couple of guys made a book and made it popular. But uh, churches today, modern churches and the non-denominational churches have embraced the secret rapture theory. Don't believe it. Don't buy into it. The Bible tells us that the Lord comes and every eye will see him. Do I have an amen? amen? Yes, every eye will see him. And Jesus is coming. I believe he could come in our lifetime. I believe he is coming soon. And when he comes, he comes with all the, cloud, all the angels of heaven. And he hovers over this earth. And we arise to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we always be with the Lord, we're told in the Bible. Do you look forward to that day? That part of which, which William Miller preached was true. And 90%, I would say, of what he preached was right on spot. But there was one thing where William Miller missed, and a uh, correction was made, and out of that correction came this church family, the Seventh-day Adventist church. All of those who believed what William Miller was preaching about the second coming were called Adventists. At that time, there were no Seventh-day Adventists. Well... I'll show you five, the pictures of four of the five I'll show you today. And so they look forward, as we do, to the day when Jesus will come with all the angels of heaven. And first, we, we are told in, in, in the Bible, in the First Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, that the, the dead in Christ, First Corinthians, well, I made that mistake last week, didn't I? First Corinthians, the fourth chapter, we're told that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel. And the dead in Christ will do what? Rise. Notice they rise from the grave. They rise from, they do not come down from heaven. They come up from the grave. They arise from the grave. That's the first thing that happens. The dead are resurrected from their sleepless sleep. The Bible repeatedly calls death sleep. They're not, I went to a funeral recently of, a, of my wife's childhood friend. And the preacher said that he was looking down at us having his funeral from heaven. And I, I wanted to stand up and say, sir, can you show me a Bible passage for that? But I was politically correct and kept my mouth shut. I like to talk to that gentleman. The Bible says that the dead are asleep in the grave. And that at the second coming, Jesus says, arise, arise, all ye who sleep in the dust of the earth, arise. And the trumpet of the Lord blows, and the dead in Christ arise with immortal bodies. Do you want an immortal body? Yes. <laughs> I do, too. And then it says, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we always be with the Lord. And then the Bible says, comfort one another with these words. What words? Of the second coming of Jesus. If we believe that all of our dead relatives in, are, all of our dead relatives are in heaven, the second coming is simply an afterthought. It's really not necessary. Because if we're going to get to heaven through death or whatever, then the second coming is okay. It's, you know, yeah, the second coming. No. There is only one way that we will get to heaven, and that is through the second coming of Jesus, and only one way we can have a hope of going with Jesus to heaven is through the blood of Christ. And so William Miller talked about the second coming, and he talked about how to get to heaven, and that is through the blood of Jesus Christ. Not only was he talking about getting out of this earth, he was talking about going to heaven, and he would talk about heaven and describe heaven in uh, broad terms and vivid terms. I want to go to heaven. How about you? And by the way, I said this when I preached on uh, heaven about four months ago. Boys and girls, heaven will be a fun place. It's not like going to church where you have to be quiet all the time. You might disturb God because God doesn't like noise. God loves to hear children laugh. He loves to see children climb trees. I talk about the, food, the, the 
the, eating the fruit from the tree of life, let me tell you what children are thinking about. Can we climb it? I don't see why not. And you can climb it and walk across the branches and go to the other side because it has two trunks, one on either side of the, of the river of life. I mean, these, these, heaven is a real place. And God loves to see people happy and rejoice in his creation. So they look forward to heaven. The Millerites do. And those early Advents did. And these Advents today do also. That's why it's part of our name. The Seventh-day Adventist is talking about the second coming of Jesus. We believe today, just as they did, that Jesus is coming back soon. Now, William Miller eventually set a date for this coming of Christ. Um, towards the end of, of uh, getting close to a few months before October 22, he settled down. There were others who had set dates, and finally he said, okay, I think October 22 is the date. And they looked forward to that day as the date they expected Jesus to come. That, why October 22? October 22, eight, in, eight, in 1844, October 22 was the Jewish Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. We call it today the Day of Cleansing. And uh, so this past, uh, I don't know if it still would be called that, if the Jews would call it, the Jewish community uh, considered this past Friday to be Yom Kippur. I didn't check. But back in those days uh, of William Miller, that was the day, and they looked forward to Jesus coming. You can imagine. They got closer and closer and closer, October 20, October 21, and they were setting their house in order, everything was ready. They were thinking, telling the boys and girls, you know, we're going home, we're going to heaven. Oh, mommy, will I be able to ride a giraffe? We're going to heaven, we'll see. Will I be able to have a, a pet lion? We're going to see. Jesus is coming soon. They would just look at each other, they would sing, and they would praise God because they're going home, and they would sing the songs of Zion. And you can imagine on that day, they got up in the morning. It was a beautiful day in the Northeast. It was just a gorgeous day. I had stood there on Ascension Rock just two years ago, the last time I did. It was a 175th anniversary. Now two years have passed since 1844. 177 years and he still is not here. How disappointed they were as he heard the gong of the clock in William Miller's house, not far from Ascension Rock. By the way, there were not just people at Ascension Rock, there were tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands worldwide of Adventists. William uh, um, Mervyn Maxwell said that the Methodists, uh, Methodists probably had uh, 30,000 members added to their faith. The Baptists, probably 40,000 added to 35 or 40,000 added to their faith as the, as, uh, the result of William Miller, William Miller preaching. So it was called now the Great Disappointment Day. I was studying with someone and I referred to that and I said, wait just a second, wait just a second. Are you saying that your church celebrates disappointment? And I said, we've got to find another name for that. Help me out, folks. We've got, I mean, that's bad PR, isn't it? We're the church that came out of the great disappointment. <laughs> and so I've changed it. I call it the day of great expectation. How does that sound? Because <laughs> it was. Yeah, they got the right event, but they had the wrong day. And Jesus, of course, said no one knows that day except whom? No one knows the day of the second coming, Jesus said, except my Father in heaven. Now, I don't know, maybe Jesus now that he is not bound here in earth as he was at that time, maybe he knows. I would think that he does now. But um, there's no man on this earth that can tell you when that day is. But we know the nearness of it. And this prophecy in Daniel 8, 14 helps us to understand the nearness of the coming of Christ. William Miller was right on that date as being the date when something wonderful happened in heaven the final cleansing of the sanctuary. Ezekiel 4 verse 6 says when it says unto 2,300 days, that actually can be translated 2,300 years. The uh, Bible sometimes in prophecy assigns one day for a year. 
And so when it says 2,300 days, that's symbolic of literally 2,300 years. So that means that uh, uh, Daniel is, uh, was told by the, uh, by the angel, angelic help, that there would be a 2,300 year point until the cleansing of the sanctuary, the final cleansing of the sanctuary. That would be towards the end of the earth. No wonder Daniel got fainted. He fainted and the angel had to come back later and talk to him. So how can we know the beginning date? Well, we're told in the Bible right there in Daniel 9, 25, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, understand that when Daniel wrote the book of Daniel, he was not in Israel. Where was he? Babylon. What state was Israel in, was Jerusalem in when Daniel was in Babylon? It lay in ruins. Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed Jerusalem, had knocked down the walls. And so now uh, Daniel 9.25 says that the city would be uh, rebuilt. And the decree to restore and rebuild old Jerusalem would be the beginning of that 2,300 year prophecy. How can we know what date that was? Ezra 7 verse 13 tells us that the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem was issued in 457 B.C. No doubt about that. 457 B.C. is the beginning date. Then this is all you need to know. You can go ahead. 2,300 years and it brings you to the year 1844. Don't want to confuse you, but remember, there's no zero year, okay? So it may come out to be, I think, 1843 if you just did it mathematically in your head right there. But remember, there was no zero year. You had B.C. that went right on into A.D. All right, that prophecy we could go spend uh, a whole week on. Uh, that prophecy told a lot about, it, it told about the, the day that Christ would be born or the year that he would be born. It told about when he died. They could have known had they studied, had they studied in, in Christ's day and known the prophecies, perhaps the Magi knew this prophecy. They knew it was time for Jesus to come. They knew it was time for him to be anointed at his baptism. They knew that it was time for the Messiah. They did not know his name was Jesus, but they knew he was the Messiah. Uh, it was time that he would come and die and be our sacrifice. That all is there in Daniel, the eighth chapter. But for our study today, we're looking at that end time event that brings us to 1844 when he did something wonderful, something very special happened in 1844 in heaven. About the Millerite movement and the revival there with Miller, Ellen G. White wrote in the book, The Great Controversy. Has anyone here ever read anything in The Great Controversy? If there's someone here who does not have a copy of The Great Controversy, talk to me or anyone in this church. We will get you a copy of The Great Controversy. It is a religious history of, um, of the church and of the world, actually. And uh, on page 401, it's written by Ellen White, who was one of the... Um, followers of, her whole family was, of, of William Miller. And she was one of four individuals who were especially instrumental in the Seventh-day Adventist, uh, or the Adventists who kept the Sabbath becoming the Seventh-day Adventist Church. She wrote, of the great religious movements since the days of the apostles, none have been, get that, none have been more free of what? of human imperfections and the wiles of Satan than that of the autumn of 1844. So right before October 22, she's talking about 1844. I mean, nothing like that had happened since the apostles. All the other great awakenings along the way, the Protestant Reformation, even the, the, the one that the, the Wesleyans, John Wesley was involved with, the first religious awakening here in the United States. That, that was not as great as Miller's, she says, and she was part of it. She says, the people were not ready to meet the Lord on that day. There was still a work of preparation to be accomplished for them, 
Light was to be given directing their minds to the temple of God. Do you get that? They were not ready. She says, back up just a moment here. All the great religious movements, none has been as wonderful and as great and free of imperfections as that Millerite revival, that second great awakening. But she says, keep going forward, but the people were not ready. How could that be? How could they be walking closer to God than anyone else in memory, and yet they were not ready? Now think about that just a moment. It's just glaring at you. Why did Jesus not return on October 22, 1844? Is it because the people were not ready? I think in part it was, for crying out loud. If they were just right there up with the Pentecost experience, what was God waiting for? What was not being done here by his people that should be done? Where had they missed the boat? Let me say this. They had the experience, but they lacked the necessary truth God felt was necessary to prepare for the coming of the Lord. Do you ever follow me? They had the experience, but they did not have all the, what? Truth. What truth did they need, for crying out loud? How many Seventh-day Sabbath keepers who were Adventists existed on October 22, 1844? Of record, only five. That means the vast majority of God's people were commandment breakers. If you believe that the Ten Commandments still are binding upon Christians, do you believe the Ten Commandments are still important, my friends? Amen. Are we saved by keeping the Ten Commandments? No. no, we're not. But if Jesus is in my heart, he will change my heart so my life reflects his life. My character becomes, his character becomes my character. I become Christ-like. Jesus does not kill. Jesus does not steal. Jesus does not bear false witness. You see? Jesus does not covet. Jesus does not break the seventh day Sabbath according to Exodus 20. How many Sabbath keepers were they? Five. Here are two of them. I told you in a sermon I had about a month ago about Rachel Oaks. She, is the one, she was an Adventist who brought the Sabbath. She was a, a seventh, seventh day Baptist who believed in William Miller's teachings and um, she actually brought it into in, in, uh, the Millerite movement and shared it with a few people just weeks before October 22, 1844. Her daughter, Delight, also was a Sabbath keeper. By the way, her daughter, Delight, was a school teacher, and her teachers, uh, she, as a school teacher, she taught her, putin, her students reading, writing, arithmetic, and also she taught them about Jesus the Creator in the Seventh-day Sabbath. And studies can show you that many of her students became leaders in the Seventh-day Adventist Church eventually. We're talking about conference presidents, evangelists, teachers themselves. God was working through all this. Frederick Wheeler was the first Seventh-day keeping uh, a, a Millerite uh, Adventist. Um, he was a Methodist minister, and um, Rachel, she shared, Rachel Oak shared uh, the truth with, with Frederick Wheeler. He shared it with a Baptist minister whose name was Thomas Preble. Thomas Preble wrote a book on the Sabbath, a little pamphlet. The name of it is longer than the book itself, I'll tell you. But, but that book was spread around. And uh, others found it even after October 22, 1844. And then there was a sister Blake we know, and I don't have a picture of her. I know nothing about her, except she lived in New Hampshire. And that was it. And so there was truth that needed to be learned and taught by God's people. God needed to cleanse his church of doctrinal error. And on October 22, 1844, God started a special cleansing of his church. You see, God has a heavenly sanctuary. But here on this earth, he also has something he calls a sanctuary. And that's his church. We are, we, we are representing God here on this earth. Your body is a temple of God. Did you know that? Yes. 
1 Corinthians 6 tells us that you are the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says that the church, you all are the temple of God. So it's biblical. We could do a whole study right there. God needed to do a work in his church if they were going to represent him. Here's the popular beliefs that uh, even today are prevalent and uh, that God needed to clear up among his people. And in 1844, he started clearing these things up in a very special way. Sunday belief instead of the Sabbath, substituting the first day of the week, which was the pagan day of worship and still is prominent among uh, pagan religions as the day of worship. The worship of the sun, you see, and that's why it's Sunday, was brought over in 321 by Constantine, who at the time was not a Christian. He later became a Christian in name only. In 321, Constantine made a Sunday law, that it was law that you had to keep, you Christians have to keep Sunday. There's nowhere in the Bible where we are told to keep Sunday in honor of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Nowhere. If you can find it, I'll give you a thousand dollars. Just for the, all right, it's not, no, no, I'll give you 10,000. You say, you don't have 10,000, I'll go borrow it, beg for it. If you can show me one passage in the Bible that says that, because this is what my cousins told me, my parents became Seventh-day Adventists when I was in diapers. And I would talk to my cousins and say, Charlie, you never can get it right. You eat the wrong thing, you go to church on the wrong day. I said, why, why do you go to church on Sunday? I go to church because the Ten Commandments tells me to go to church on, on the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. He said, Charlie, we go to church on Sunday because the resurrection of Jesus was on the first day of the week. I went back, Mom, Dad, what did I say? Said, Ask them to show you scripture. They're still looking. It's not there. I've had many relatives to come to me, and they've said, Charlie, I need to apologize to you. Our doctors put us on the Adventist diet. Our doctors have taken away our pork. Our doctors have taken away our cigarettes. Our doctors are taking away our alcohol. Yeah, I guess you were right, Charlie. I said, that's not me. It's the message that the Lord has given to this church that makes a difference. It's not me. And it does make a difference. What I hear now is people say, all right, there's no biblical evidence, but it's just the important thing is we just choose a day. Would my wife feel comfortable? You know. She's not here so we can talk about her. My wife... Would she, be honest, would she be okay if I said, it doesn't matter which woman you choose, just as long as you choose one at a time? Hmm? If, I get, if I get tired of my wife, it's okay, I just choose one. It's okay. No. It matters to God. It would matter to my wife, let me tell you. I know her, and I don't want any other woman, and I don't want any other Sabbath day. Sabbath is a happy day, happy day. I love what? Every what? I'm going to do it again. Sabbath is a happy day, happy day, happy day. Sabbath is a happy day. I love every Sabbath, yes. So the church needed to get it, come into truth. All right, eternal hell. Same, most of the same churches that, that, that uh, teach that we go to church on the wrong day also are saying that there's an eternal hell, that God just puts you, when you die, he puts you there, and there, eternity is a long time, my friends. What does that say about the character of God? Yeah. The Bible teaches that there will be hellfire, but it consumes the earth, and it goes out, and then God makes a new heaven and a new earth. They didn't believe that. Now they do. More truth needed to be learned. The Bible teaches that the, that, that the soul is not immortal. What is a soul, by the way? Two things make up a soul. What is it? Dust of the earth and what else? The breath of life. That's it. We, are not, we do not have Casper the ghost living inside us trying to wing his way to heaven. Right? Casper the ghost is a figment of someone's imagination. 
The soul requires two things, the dust of the earth, the body, and the breath of life, the spark of life that comes from God. Those two things. So what happened to my friend who passed away three weeks ago? Where is he now? He's asleep in the grave, waiting for the Lord to come. He wasn't looking over the banister of heaven at his wife, weeping across the aisle from us, just weeping. That wouldn't make him ha happy in heaven. God spared him of that pain. He'd be up there. No, the dead know not what? They don't know anything. They know nothing. You got it. They didn't know that then, but they do now. Death is a sleep time and again in the Bible. Death is a dreamless sleep, we're told. Another one, anything goes, what am I talking about? <laughs> the health message. God doesn't care what I do to my body as long as my heart's right. I've heard that time and again as a pastor, an Adventist pastor. God gave a health message. Our body is a temple of God. Baptism. By sprinkling, very popular then. Baptism by immersion, the only way for baptism. All right. Why didn't Jesus return in October 22, 1844? Why didn't he return yesterday? Well, we have the truth, but we lack their experience, my friends. Do you know what they did a few days before? <laughs> They were responsible people. I, I don't know why some of them worried about it. They gave their horses and their cows away. They didn't go out and plow the fields. They left their potatoes. This was an agricultural society then. They left them, left them there. Because they believed with all their heart that Jesus was coming back. So what did God do October 22, 1844? The next morning, after praying all night long, a fellow named Hiram Edson was walking out of, his, uh, out of a corn crib where he had been praying all night with another group of people. And as he's walking through a cornfield on October 23, 1844, suddenly it hit him. Now, whether it was a vision or whether it was a thought that God put in his mind or just automatically everything came together, it was as if he saw Jesus had just entered into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And he couldn't wait to tell everyone that Jesus has started his final phase of cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. Hebrews 9.12 says, By his own blood, Jesus entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And so he, returned, he entered into the holy place of heaven, the first compartment. Remember, there are two rooms in the heavenly sanctuary. And Jesus went to heaven to be our high priest. He entered into the first compartment. But now he has entered into the second compartment called the most holy place to do the final work of the cleansing of the sanctuary. Cleansing it of what? Of the records of our sins. Jesus offers his merits of his blood in heaven on our behalf today. I don't care what you did this week that you should not have won. Done. Jesus died for that, and now you can find acceptance because of the blood of Jesus Christ. I don't care what you did last night. I made a mistake one time. This girl I was interested in, I'd known her for some time, and she wanted me to take her to the fair, and so I took her. And we rode the Ferris wheel and everything else, and I got sick that night. <clears throat> It was a Friday night. I felt bad the whole time. And the next morning I had to sing in church. A teenager. I wasn't brought up that way. I felt horrible. I took it to the Lord. And I said, Lord, forgive me. I am so sorry. Forgive me. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleansed me of all unrighteousness. I never did that again. <laughs> What did the cleansing of the sanctuary mean? What does that mean? Review what happened in the Old Testament. If you sinned, you would take a lamb to the sanctuary. You'd go to the courtyard of the sanctuary by the altar where the lambs were put on after they were sacrificed, after they, they were killed. You would put your hands on that lamb, that perfect lamb, and that perfect lamb's blood now was a, a sponge for your sin, symbolically. 
but it's like that, that blood of that lamb was a sponge for the sin. By the way, that lamb could not save anyone. That lamb represented someone. Who was it? John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That lamb represented Jesus Christ. The perfect lamb was slain and his blood was caught in a basin. The lamb was placed on the altar, its body was. But that blood that now symbolically had absorbed your sin, it was a record symbolically of your sin if you were back there, the priest would take into the sanctuary. You could not go into the sanctuary. Only the priest could. You and I do not go today into the heavenly sanctuary except by faith. And so the priest would go, notice carefully what happened. The old sacrifice pointed, by the way, to Jesus who would die for us. It was all symbolic. The blood of the lamb acted as a sponge for the confession of sins, and the priest would take that blood into an altar of incense, and he would sprinkle that blood on the altar, on the front of the altar. Sometimes he would, depending on who had sinned, he would put it on the horns of the altar. And that altar was, was right before a curtain that separated the holy from the most holy place. Now remember, the, the, the blood is a sponge for sin. He would then take some blood and he would sprinkle it on the curtain. And then the priest would leave the sanctuary and go wait on another customer. This is kind of a primitive uh, sketch. A friend of mine drew this for me. I said, I want an aerial view of the sanctuary. You see you have the altar there, and then you have the, the holy place and the most holy place. Every day the priest would, would go about sprinkling blood inside the sanctuary, and what he was doing is leaving a record of your confessed sin on the curtain or on that altar of incense every day. Then he would leave and go help someone else. Here's what happened. <clears throat> the lamb was slain. The blood was taken. It was put on the altar there at the uh, outside of the sanctuary, the courtyard. And then the priest would go into the holy place inside it, and he would then go to the altar of incense, and he would sprinkle blood. Notice the progression. See the arrows? The progression inward. And then the blood would be placed on the curtain, and then he would leave and go wait on another sinner. All right? We're going to see what happens at another ceremony because that's what happened every day. Once a year, on the Day of Atonement, once a year, something else happened. There was a different process. On that day, the priest would take the blood of the animal and the blood, he would take it into the holy place. Then he would lift up the curtain and he would go into the most holy place. And there in the most holy place was this altar. And above the altar were two angels. They were beaten by, uh, by gold, beaten out by go in gold into the shape of, of angels. And the glory of God was right there over that altar, the visible glory of God. And the priest, the high priest, would stand there with that blood facing God Almighty. Nothing between he and God, the presence of God. And he would sprinkle that blood on the altar, and he would sprinkle it on the front of the altar. That was called the cleansing of the sanctuary. What was being cleansed? The record of sins that had accumulated from all the people of Israel throughout that year were being cleansed from the sanctuary. It was the day of judgment. If uh, at the end of that day you had not confessed your sins, you would be cut off from Israel. That's it, cut off. Some believe that that means you would be executed. I'm not sure about that, but. All right, here's the progression. On the day of atonement, the priest would take the blood and go right into the presence of God without sprinkling the blood. Notice the way the arrows are headed this time. He would sprinkle it on the altar, on the mercy seat, that is. He would sprinkle the blood. And then the priest would sprinkle it in front of the altar, on the front of the altar, of the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant. Then he would come back into the holy place. He would sprinkle it there at the curtain on the altar of incense. And then he would continue. He would sprinkle it before the altar and on the altar. And notice the progression again. Which way is he going, in or out of the sanctuary? He's going out. This is significant, my friends. And then he would continue 
to the, to the uh, courtyard and he would take his bloody hands and he would place those bloody hands on the head of another animal, not a lamb this time, it's a goat. The blood was a goat on the Day of Atonement. And he would place his, what has happened, that blood it acts as a sponge for sin and he is transferring that over to the scapegoat. And the scapegoat was then taken off into the wilderness and there it was let go. And the priest would have to cleanse himself symbolically, this showing that he was being cleansed of that sin that he had been the last one to touch. This is what it meant when it talked about the cleansing of the sanctuary in the Old Testament, and this is how it happens in heaven. Jesus is cleansing the sanctuary of the records of every sin that has been committed since the foundation of the earth. The cleansing of the sanctuary in the Old Testament was a symbol of the final work of judgment prior to Christ's second coming. We are there now. Since 1844, we have been living in the great day of judgment. God's judgment hour is here. There is hope for us. 1 John 2, verse 1, 2 says, if anyone sins, has anyone here ever sinned? Don't raise your hand. Huh? Has anyone sinned? I mean, we could all raise both hands. We have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ is there now. He went, Jesus, on October 22, 1844, went into the second compartment, the most holy place. He went beyond that veil. And he starts the final cleansing of the sanctuary, and that is removing sin once and for all. Taking your sins so it shows that your records is perfect. She never sinned. He never sinned. We are covered by the blood of Jesus. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but what? The blood of Jesus. 1 John 2, verse 2. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of every person who has ever breathed the breath of air. Does that mean all will be saved? No, most will not be saved because they have not accepted the free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. That's what's happening now, but soon that will all end. So that brings us to the laundry day. Sunday is the laundry day in the house of Ferguson. My wife runs the washing machine. I'm not very good with running machines like that, so she does that. Actually, she has taught me how to do it, and I have made some mistakes we won't go into. So I am forbidden from making any more bubbles. And so we have this hamper. It happens to be in our clothes closet next to our bath bathroom, restroom. And so we have uh, the hamper there, and throughout the week we throw stuff in there. And uh, I forget the stuff sometimes, you know. And so Sharon will take the hamper, and she'll say, Honey, would you mind taking the washing back? This is more than I know you want to know about the life of the Fergusons, but will you take the, the, the dirty laundry back? So I pick it up, and I go back. I did this one time, and I said, hey, I need an illustration. So I grabbed, actually grabbed it and brought it and put it on the stage. And Sharon's sitting there saying, that's my underwear up there. And I, so I slides, I showed her the slide. So I said, we're OK. This is kosher. <clears throat> So then you have this whole thing where, you know, she puts the wash, the, and, and anyhow. Here is inevitably what happens, is I will say, honey, I forgot the socks I wore yesterday. She will say, I'm sorry, but I've already finished the dark. I'm doing the white right now, and I don't want your dirty socks in my white, you know, sheets. So this is what happens. Day of judgment has happened for my socks. That's it. <laughs> You know, they have to wait to another week, and, and in this case, there is going to be another time. All right, you get, it, you get the concept of the laundry day in heaven. At the cross, Jesus took our dirty laundry upon himself. His blood 
cleanses us from all iniquity. It's a sponge for our sins. So at the cross, he took it on himself. And when he entered into the holy place in heaven, he bore the record of our sins. Here's the good news. In 1844, he started the washing machine in heaven. You got it? He started that process of cleansing us so that the record shows there's no fault in me. I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. You're covered by the blood of Jesus. But one day, that's going to end. That's it. And what does he say on that? He that is just, let him be just still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. Behold, I come quickly. What? My reward is with me. When Jesus comes back, he knows who gets what. Soon laundry day will be over. And we're over here today too. Now is not too late. This is the day of the cleansing of the sanctuary. A day of solemn assembly it was. A day of opening your heart to the Lord and saying, come in. Know me, Lord. Search me. See if there be any unclean way in me. Now is the time to do that. When Jesus comes, he has already, already determined who gets what. He says, my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. Revelation 22, verse 12. But right now, at this moment, it's not too late, my friends. So I want to invite our singers, our praise singers, to come forward and lead us in our closing song today. We're going to change it. Understand, what are we singing? To God be the glory. Great. I'll do it. I can do it. I can't do it. Are we on? Okay. I will ask everybody to stand. I am invited to stand and sing together.
heaven, we thank you for being here with us this morning. And now as we leave, Lord, go with us. I pray that you'll be in our hearts and our minds, that we will think on you on this Sabbath day. And Lord, if there's someone here that feels that everything is not right with their soul and their Savior, Lord, speak to that one. May they see that your arms are wide open today, that it is not too late to come regardless of what's happened in their lives, that regardless of what they have done or not done, that you readily receive them just as they are, but Lord, you will change them so that they reflect your character. Cleanse us, Lord. Make us like you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Hey, what do you say? I understand you are singing this as we finish. Sure. That's the plan. Let's sing. God be with you till we meet again. God bless you. Happy Sabbath.